I'm Steve Lydon with Optics Planet, and I've mounted thousands of scopes professionally since the 1980s. I'd like to share with you how I mount a standard scope on a standard bolt-action rifle. This scope here is one of our OpMod Zeiss Conquests, and as father OpMod, this is serial number OP0001. Uh, it's a great scope. Uh, it's the last U.S. assembled Conquest made in Germany, assembled in the U.S. Uh, the new ones are offshore. The rifle I'm putting this on is a Howa 1500. It's been to Africa with me a couple of times. It's a standard bolt action 30-06. It's a gun that I shoot really well without thinking too much about it. It's been to a lot of Western trips. It's not a very fancy gun, but it shoots straight and it always goes bang when you pull the trigger. It's a standard one inch, three to nine by 40 scope on a standard long action, bolt action rifle. Of course, the first thing you have to do is make sure the gun is clear. You can check your magazine if you have one, stick your finger in the chamber, gun's clear. I like to use loophole dual dovetails whenever I can. This is not a loophole commercial, there's a lot of loophole products here, there's a lot of Tipton products here. I'm not trying to make a commercial, I'm just trying to share with you what I like and what has always worked for me over the years. I'm using the standard dual dovetail bases that I took off this gun previously. This is also a dual dovetail base. Dual dovetail meaning the rings get put in like this and they're turned 90 degrees to lock them in. These two bases on the rear look identical. The two on the front accept the rings the same way, but you'll see this one is positioned a little bit further rearward. This is called a reversible front. So when you see a standard front or a reversible front, this is what a reversible front is. And you can see it gives you about a half inch less room between the rings. So if you have a shorter scope, or a lot of times you'll have a scope with a 50 millimeter or larger objective lens, that objective bell comes back further on the tube, which gives you less room to mount your scope on. So if you need a little bit more room or you have a short scope, you might consider using a reversible front. Sometimes there's reversible rears as well. You can also see that this is hanging over the ejection port a little bit. This means zero difference. It won't affect anything. A standard two-piece base or a standard one-piece base, it's called a standard STD, they use windage screws in the rear. And how this works is the ring gets set in the middle, gets positioned in the middle, and these two screws are tightened in opposing fashion so they squeeze the ring onto the base. The feature that a standard ring and base will give you is that you could move them laterally to adjust for major windage adjustments. Uh, so uh, I'll give you an example uh, why you must use these sometimes. I had two friends, uh, my uh, uh, two good hunting partners, and they both had brand new stainless Remington 700s. And I was going to mount the scopes for them, good scopes, good guns. And I used the dual dovetail, which is not adjustable like the standard base. When I bore sighted them, when I was done mounting the scopes, one of them was perfect, it was right on. The other one was so far off to the left, not only could I not adjust the internal mechanism of the scope to get a good zero, but your scope is also much less strong when it's not with the adjustments in the center mechanically of the scope. So for that fellow's gun, I had to use a standard rear base, which again adjusted for large variance in windage. But generally, I like to use dual dovetails. I like to use non-reversible fronts because it simply just looks very clean. I also prefer a dual dovetail because then you have two less parts and two less chances of things going wrong. I like the fewest parts possible. Uh, in, it increases reliability in, in all aspects. We're using two-piece bases as opposed to a one-piece base, and this is what I prefer because 
A lot of people will think a one-piece base is stronger. That's really not necessarily true. This one-piece base, although it's for a short action, it doesn't really fit here. One, two, three screw holes. So you have three screw holes instead of the four used on a two-piece base, and also it gives you more room to load your gun. You will also not have an issue with uh, ejection and extraction with this extra uh, piece hanging over the top of the receiver. That's not really an issue, but loading it, especially with frozen or gloved fingers, is certainly an issue. So I prefer two-piece bases. Are they stronger? Yes, minutely it will strengthen the action, but you and I will never notice a practical accuracy difference between a one-piece base and a two-piece base. Since I've already determined what bases and what rings and what ring height I'm gonna use for this particular size scope, now I'm getting ready to mount the bases onto the gun. If it's a new gun, these holes generally come with filler screws and you need a very small screwdriver. Your Wheeler kit has proper size screwdrivers in there. Just remove them. I would advise that you save those filler screws. Since I'm remounting these bases on this gun, there was a little bit of overflow from extra Loctite and it leached out of the screw holes a little bit and it's a little ugly and it's not perfectly uniform. So I like to, uh, I'd like to get that off, and solvents really don't do it too well. It's kind of an epoxy. I have here a stainless steel brush. This doesn't belong on the exterior of firearms. It's very aggressive, and it'll remove bluing and scratch metal pretty easily. On the other side of the spectrum is the standard nylon brush, which is really not aggressive enough. It's like a, an abrasive cloth almost. It just really doesn't do it. I don't have a bronze brush with me today, but I have a regular bronze bore brush. And in a pinch, that will do a pretty darn good job. It's basically the same as your toothbrush. And I don't know if you guys could have seen this before and after, but it polishes up very nicely. You can also use uh, ultra fine brass wool if you wanted to, something like that. Now that's, that's clean enough for me. I like that quite a bit. And it's very, very important to degrease the screw holes and even with a new gun, you want to remove all the factory grease. A couple things to remember here. A lot of people will use a, a product, uh, and to degrease, you could use a product made for a gun. You could use, some people use brake cleaner, some people use contact cleaner. There's a variety of manufacturers that will make uh, degreasers in aerosol and pump form. Uh, I, I like gun scrubber, it's a good product. But keep in mind, when you're using some of these volatile chemical chemicals, first of all, make sure you have good ventilation. Secondly, you might want to wear rubber gloves. You might want to wear glasses so it doesn't get in your eyes. It stings really fun when you get it in your eyes. Keep in mind also that if you're spraying this liberally on the receiver, it's going to get onto your stock. And this might look like a beautiful piece of wood, but it's an actual, uh, actually it's a synthetic stock from Bell and & Carlson. And it's an older gun and it's a little susceptible to modern chemicals. So I don't like to liberally spray products uh, on this. You can also uh, drop your magazine plate if you wanted to so debris will fall all the way through. What I'll generally do is I'll degrease it just with some, some gun scrubber right on the top. That's just fine. And then I will degrease my bases completely. And again, watch where you're doing this. It's, it has a very, very strong scent. It dries easily, dries very, very well. And now no lubricant or rust preventative is on these bases at all. So I like to recoat them with a little bit of oil, but to address the screw holes, if I don't want to spray the uh, degreaser in there. What I usually use is, uh, it's a little bit wasteful, but I'll just take a pointed end of a Q-tip and come in here and you'll be surprised how much dirt and grease and debris that you'll get out of there. Even when you spray the cleaner with a powerful jet into it, and this has been pretty clean, but you'll see you'll, you'll always get a little bit more debris in there. And then I like to dry it out. You could use whatever Q-tips you want. 
A lot of times you have to use what's available, which means the corner of a rag or the corner of a cleaning patch and a toothpick or a, a small tweaker or something like this. My screw holes are now degreased. So are my bases. And I like to put a fresh coat of oil. Whatever gun oil you like to use, WD-40 is not a gun oil. I like to use products that are made for firearms in general. Uh, I like the M-Pro 7 cleaners and lubricants a lot because as a hunter, they don't stink in the field. It's also, they're also biodegradable. It won't eat your fingernails and it won't start messing up your skin. In this case, I'm just gonna go the easy path and I'll use a little bit of Barricade, Birchwood Casey Barricade, which, was one of, which has always been one of my favorite rust preventatives. A little bit goes a long way. Just put a little, almost a microscopic coat on there. And with the residue that's left over from the oil, I'll put a little bit on the receiver and you see it's not getting in the screw holes. It's just a little bit of rust prevention on the top of the receiver. The screws are also pretty important. I have, have to clean these up a little bit. Uh, I don't see a lot of Loctite on here, so I'll just give these a little shot of gun scrubber. Uh, watch where you're doing this. If your gun room or wherever you're doing it is on the carpet, these screws are easily lost. You can position the bases where you want them. And just because the spacing is the same, let's say between a Remington Model 700 and a Winchester Model 70, the spacing is the same, the threads are the same, the heights of the bases are different. So just because something matches up in terms of the hole spacing does not mean that they're the proper bases. So try to ensure, well, you must ensure that you're using the proper equipment. I really like uh, the loophole uh, Torx wrench. It's a lot easier to use those than it is to use the small wrench that comes in the package. Now this will go both ways. You see it's sticking over the ejection port a little bit. You can put it on this way, but you know what? Then you won't be able to lift your bolt. So this only goes one way. And again, just because something is poking over the ejection port, that's normally just absolutely fine. Speak about Loctite a little bit, uh, or some kind of thread locker. A lot of people make it, and it used to be there was blue Loctite and there's red Loctite. Blue Loctite was removable, red Loctite was permanent. But now they make them in all different colors. You just have to make sure it says removable on the package. See, this is red, this is a red Loctite, but it's a removable product. So just make sure that it says removable. Uh, it's a number 15 Torx wrench, and if you could see how much I'm putting on here, a lot of people will put on way, way too much. It's just a, just a little dab will do you. Just a, just a little touch will do you. And one of the most common problems that people have when mounting a scope is that they tighten it way, way too much. Another issue that they have, i just put a little bit right there, that's plenty, folks, is that there are long screws and there are short screws in a base package regularly and you have to determine where the long ones go, where the short ones go. The easiest way is to just kind of figure it out. And when you put them in there, you can feel underneath the receiver bridge. And if the screws are protruding, swap them around. Uh, it's, it's kind of obvious, longer screws go in a place with a deeper base and more, of a, a more substantial receiver metal. Again, keep in mind that uh, it's really easy to use way too much force and way too much Loctite. And I'm going to use a, a, a Wheeler torque wrench. It's, called a, it's a fat wrench. It's, a, it's an actual torque wrench. And it's measured in inch pounds. And you could see to my left here the little chart I put on the wall about how tight to make these. And I'll put these base screws at about 30 pounds. I'll adjust my fat wrench to about 30 pounds. Now 
how you do that is you just pull it out and you turn it until it goes up to approximately 30. And you can see, even with these very, very sturdy steel bases, steel screws, that's it, that's 30 inch pounds. Just until it clicks, that's all you need to do. And this is perfect, it's never going anywhere, I promise you. Especially when you use a little bit of lubricant like the thread locker acts as. The tube does dry up, so keep it capped. So my bases are completely done. Since I already took these off, they are, uh, there's no grease in there like normally comes on a factory uh, base. I'm not using the rings that I took off of here, but I'm using an identical kind because the very new loophole rings of the same size, these are medium dual dovetails, happen to have a really nice looking loophole logo on the top of the rings. They just started doing that not too long ago. I think it's neat and it looks very attractive and this is what I'm gonna put on this gun in this case. The loophole ring wrench is one of my favorite, favorite products. Normally to install, now this is greased from the factory. It has a little bit of grease on it. That's plenty. Normally you would just take this and turn it as close as you can get to 90 degrees. You can kind of eye it up. And this really doesn't matter which way it goes on. You can see they can't really do this by hand. If you don't have a ring wrench, what you do is you assemble the top and the bottoms loosely and you could use a screwdriver handle or a piece of wood or something like that. You generally don't want to use something metal because you'll ding up the edges and it looks a little bit ugly. There's, there's no reason to be scratching things up. Uh, so I want my L's facing the same way. And an easy way for me to do that is, I, I cheat a little bit, I'll take my custom OpMod knife here, and you might want to use glasses, but I will remove this ring and I'll put a little scratch right here, just like that, so I know that that scratch goes to me to my left, that's always my front ring. My back one, put a little scratch there, it's easily seen. So this goes here, and the reason you do this is because sometimes you'll knock them over after you lap your rings or you're doing something, you don't know which way it was oriented. Now I'm getting ready to try to ensure that my rings are uh, parallel with the bore. And an easy way to do this is to use a one inch rod and you sit it in here and it just happens to be that this looks like it's almost exactly in the middle. I won't have to fool around with this anymore. Uh, sometimes you could just tap it over a little bit. You always need to have a hammer with you. So what I'm gonna do here is take my one inch alignment bars from my wheeler kit loosely install my ring tops. You can see from the factory, there is Loctite on the ring screws, which also acts again as a lubricant. In this case, my base screws were all the same size and there's nothing protruding. You want these points to line up. You could just snug these bars up. These don't really line up, and I can't really move it by hand, so what I'll do loosen it a bit, slide it out, use my hammer. Now, it doesn't always happen like that, but it looks to be about identical. It looks that the points are very, very close to touching. Another way to do this, a customer brought this to my attention, you don't have to use the points all the time. You can use the back end of it 
and it seems to be a little easier visually to determine if you are lined up square. This is just a couple thousandths off. I'll just, man, that's, that's it right there. That is absolutely beautiful. You can understand now that this is parallel to the bore. You're not gonna be torquing your scope. A ring is not this way and this way with a one inch bar. You're not torquing your scope. You're not gonna be scratching it up. So I know that I'm aligned now and you don't always have to lap rings, but I like lapping rings. Lapping rings is removing a little bit of metal around the interior of the ring so you get really a 360 degree purchase on the scope. There's also no sharp edges or nothing gonna be sticking out. You can tell how many times I've used this lapping bar because all the bluing is rubbed off on it. And you put a handle right in the middle. Another thing I like to do is to put a little piece of tape around this handle because when you're working this back and forth, you can easily ding these rings up. And you know, when you fall down a hill when you're hunting and you scratch your gun up, that's one thing. When you ding it up from doing careless, uh, careless things, it, it's pretty aggravating. So I just put a little piece of tape on there. Uh, a lot of times I'll I'll, I'll hit the ring anyway, I don't mean to, but it happens. Now you could use your 220 grit lapping compound. And this is very, very messy. It'll stain everything like crazy. So watch what clothing you're wearing. Have a garbage can with, uh, with a bag in it maybe to throw your, throw your stuff in. You can pretty much liberally apply it. You don't want to put all that much on it because then you just have to clean it off when you're done. And it's pretty messy. You don't want to drop any of this in your action. And you can leave your jug open because you're going to be using it for a while. I just uh, got, I saw the new Wheeler lapping bar kit and in it comes a new kind of lapping bar that I would really love to have. It's the same old one inch lapping bar that accepts the handle, but now it has a flexible rod that you could put into a power drill. This is one of these aha things that no one had thought of before. So now instead of me going back and forth like this for a long time and a little elbow grease, now I could just stick this on a drill and zip it and I should be done in a few minutes. But I don't own one of those yet, so we'll do it like I always have done it. That's a little bit loose. You want it a little bit more snug. It's pretty snug right now. And you're gonna start by just working this sucker back and forth, back and forth. And this is gonna take a while. Now, since I have new rings, the inside of the rings were blued. And by the time I'm done with this, most of it will be silver. So I'm pulling up when I'm doing this. I'm pushing down when I'm doing this. I'm going port and starboard when I'm doing this as an old Navy guy. It gets easier as it goes along. You might need to take another little fraction of a turn on the ring screws to make it tight again. And feel free to use more lapping compound. Just want to use it a little judiciously. You see how it, it's loosening up on me. And when I take these off, you'll be able to tell the minuscule amount of surface material that was removed. And you can also see why I would really like this flexible rod. Usually you do this for about five minutes, you should be good. I think that's enough for now. Let me Remove these, and now uh, be careful so some of the chunks of lapping compound that you see around the rings don't fall into your action or anything. Sandpaper in your action is not a good idea. Uh, make sure to watch where that goes until you get a chance to clean it off. You can cl start cleaning this stuff with whatever you like. I use disposables for the big stuff. 
and then I take them off and we will degrease everything nicely. And again, it's very important to get all of this abrasive paste off of your rings and certainly out of your action. Here's my gun scrubber. When we started, that ring was this color all the way around. Now, it is this color. You could see how burnished it is. You could see about 85% uh, of all of this surface area has been completely smoothed out. Not only the top ring, but the bottom ring. And what's neat about those little scratches, again, is that you know how to orient that ring back in the exact same place where you just polished it up. And they make chemicals every day. Feel free to use them. You don't have to really be sparing with these things. I suppose the most important thing is is to take an extra couple of minutes if you feel you need to because you only have to do this one time and you have to do it one time the right way. Save your old t-shirts, your old socks. Um, uh, even though I cleaned these pretty well already, I'm gonna do it again. Do it one time the right way. And it's really nice to have those marks so I know which way these rings are oriented. When you do this, a lot of times some debris will get stuck on the corners or underneath. So I use uh, my socks and my old shirts and I like lighter colored rags. Then you could see if you missed anything. There, I missed a little bit right there. You could see it coming up on the lighter colored rag. Okay, I'm satisfied that that is a very good job. There wasn't a lot to it. And you can see how shiny these are now. Uh, most of the surface metal has been removed and that is just a beautiful fit. When you drop a scope into something like this, it just drops all the way down to the bottom. It's absolutely perfect. Now you can see here, by the way, that uh, there's a little bit of room here and a lot of people would say that my rings are too high. Well, they, they can say that all they like. I also have low rings. They're about uh, just a little bit, uh, they're about a tenth of an inch lower. But keep in mind that I have a pretty good size eye box here and working my bolt vigorously, I don't want to hang in my knuckles. So uh, a tenth of an inch higher off the barrel for the, uh, for the objective lens really means zero. Don't trouble yourself about these little uh, picky -un issues. I'm ready to mount my scope. You always want to mount your scope at its highest power. And the reason for that is that your eye relief, that's the difference between the uh, ocular lens and your eyeball, is a little bit smaller when you're at higher power. And again, this is pretty cool. My little scratch is right there. I know that is towards me to my right. Here's my little scratch here. I know it's towards me to my left. Even though I was throwing these around, I know that this is the position they were in when I lapped those rings. There's already lubricant on these screws out of the box because that is the factory blue removable Loctite that Leupold gives you. And some folks really, really torque these things down because there's gaps between the top and bottom ring. There's supposed to be gaps. Your job is to make sure that the gaps are equal on all four sides. So I usually like to pull up a little bit. And that looks pretty good. Uh, like I preface this by saying I, I've done it a lot. This, this might take you a few turns. That's okay. It used to take me a few turns too. 
What I'm going to do now is I'm going to adjust my eye relief. And you want to adjust the scope to your eye, not your head to the scope. So in this case, what I'm going to do, and I know this scope isn't going to fall off, and it's loose enough for me to turn in the rings fore and aft without scratching it up. So uh, I'm just going to shoulder my gun, open my eye, and I should get a full picture right there. And you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm done right here. So uh, measure twice. Man, that's just absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. So this is where I want this scope. You can see there's plenty of room between the ocular bell and the end of the base. Plenty of room between the uh, objective lens and the barrel. There's plenty of room for clearance working my bolt. I can gradually, uh, I noticed my reticle was straight. Uh, this, this comes with practice and even though I've mounted all these scopes, I, I still will have to remount a scope uh, two or three times, sometimes to get it absolutely perfect. Everyone's eye is different. Your eye is going to tell you your reticle is straight when I pick up your gun and I don't think it's straight. Straighten the reticle for you, not for me. You're shooting it, not me. There are other devices that will let you adjust your scope. Uh, this is called the Level, Level, Level by Wheeler. A lot of people like these a lot. I don't use them. I like to adjust my scopes by eye. So I'm going to ensure that my ring gaps are the same on all four sides. And before I get too tight, make sure that my reticle is straight. And if you want to know how uh, easy it is to uh, think that your scope is straight and then not, shoulder the gun with a different arm and a different eye. It always seems different. So it's not only from person to person, but it's from shoulder to shoulder and eye to eye. I feel pretty confident that I'll like the way that reticle looks in terms of straightness. I'm snugging this up, making sure that my gaps are the same. You know, that's, that's really the mark of a professional job when every, all the details are correct. Uh, if you do these things I'm saying, you'll be very proud of this job and you'll never have to do it again. You can see that my fat wrench is adjusted to 25 inch pounds and I'd like to bring your attention to the chart behind me. This information is also included when you buy a fat wrench or a lapping kit or something like this with a torque wrench. Uh, you can see that aluminum rings, 10 to 15 inch pounds, they're very easily stripped. A lot of these aluminums will not have torque screws, they'll just have standard uh, Allen wrenches. Steel uh, rings, 15, 20 pounds, base strings, 30. Windage, 30 to 35 pounds. Uh, these are the windage screws that I spoke to you earlier about uh, that are used with a standard base, either one piece or two piece and a half inch 1913 mil spec or what people know as a Picatinny rail. Uh, that's about 65 inch pounds on the half inch cross bolt. Uh, pick rails are another issue. We could speak about those at a later date. I also wanted to bring to your attention why I really like a screwdriver kit made for firearms. This uh, Wheeler kit is fantastic. If you get the full kit, it'll have a lot of gunsmithing tools that most folks will never use, let alone know what they are. But gunsmith screwdriver kits have blades that are flat ground. And in this amazing illustration here, you can see that a flat ground screwdriver, this is a flat ground bit, fits perfectly into the screw. It fits nice and flat. Your Ace Hardware regular uh, Stanley screwdriver that you get does not fit into the screw slot well. So you can ding up these little pieces and round off the corners. And that's just another way to be unprofessional. It, it shows. People know that you're monkeying around with stuff instead of knowing what you're doing. So even one or two good sizes of screwdrivers to fit 
the screws on your particular gun or your application. Uh, remember, hollow ground, flat ground. This is all done here, and now I'd, I'd like to uh, show you how to bore sight a gun. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to do this. The old school way was called bore sighting because this is what you do. You bore sight it. You would actually take the gun, put it in a vise, and move that vise around while looking through the bore till you can see a bullseye through your bore right there. So, so you could see a bullseye right there. Then you adjust your scope up, down, left, and right until your reticle is also on that bullseye. That's why it's called bore sighting. You're looking through the bore. Another way to do it is with a magnetic bore sighter or a collimating bore sighter. This just happens to be the loophole bore sighter. It's a magnetic bore sighter. It has a little light on the top. Stick it on. Yes, it will work on stainless guns. I know stainless is not magnetic, but stainless firearms are not completely stainless. They do have carbon steel on in there, and they are magnetic. Now, what you would see here is a grid, like on a piece of graph paper with a zero in the middle, and you simply adjust left, right, up, down, moving your windage and elevation adjustments so your crosshairs are in the middle of this grid. My favorite way to do it is with our new OpMod laser bore sighter. This is the best product on the market for bore sighting a gun. It's a laser, it's green, which is many, many times more visible to, the, to your human eye than a red laser. And click it on, and all you would do is, uh, let me show you here, you would simply aim this at something 50 or 100 yards away, and you would adjust your windage and elevation dials so they meet that dot at that distance. I think we've covered a lot of things. I'm looking forward uh, in other chapters to explain how I mount a scope on maybe a 3 8 inch dovetail rail or an 11 millimeter or 13 millimeter air gun or a 22 or a 1913 mil standard or Picatinny rail. Uh, glad to share these things with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. <music>